Welcome everyone. I'm Julia Friedgood from American Farmland Trust and an author of our new report, Farms Under Threat, The State of the States. I'm joined today with two of my colleagues, Mitch Hunter and Jen Dempsey. Mitch is AFT's Director of Research and Jennifer directs our Farmland Information Center. I'm guessing since this is an AFT event that most of you are familiar with who we are and what we do. But for those of you who maybe are a little bit less familiar, American Farmland Trust is a nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980, and we work to save the land that sustains us, protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and keeping farmers on the land. So we're also curious about who you are. So we have a little poll to start this off, and um, we're going to find out kind of who you are and where you come from. Wendy, can you do that? There we go. And this just takes a minute or less, 30 seconds, for people to answer their questions, and then we will post the results. So, Wendy, you think it's time to post? Terrific. Wow, very interesting. Um, we did this this morning in our, in our kickoff session and there were a lot of land trusts, but here I can see that the majority of folks here are land trusts, which is really interesting. I hope that you'll be excited to learn about our policy recommendations as well as about our spatial um, findings. Um, so today, uh, next slide. Uh, the agenda for today is very briefly, we're gonna give you an overview of our report. Mitch, can you advance the slide? Are we doing okay with technology? I, on my screen, I'm showing the agenda slide. Can you not see that, Julia? I cannot, but I hope that others can and our audience can. Um, so, mm -hmm. no, it still isn't there. But anyway, so we're gonna give you an overview of our report and encourage you to mm -hmm. use our findings and then I'm going to start with just a little bit of background on the drivers of conversion. Mm -hmm. And then Mitch is going to take us through the spatial findings and visualizing the threats. Jennifer is going to take over with the Agland policy scorecard and talk about assessing the policy response. And then I'm going to come in and, and give you some recommendations that came out of all of this work. And Mitch is going to do a little preview of our microsite so that you can see some of the functionality that we have on the web for you to explore our data and findings. And then we're gonna do Q and A. And our hope is that we have at least half an hour if not 40 minutes for that Q and A. Um, in order to participate, because there are a lot of people who are involved, we have limited not doing the sort of live Q and A. Um, so that there's a Q and A box at the bottom. Um, ask your questions upvote questions that you think are of, of special interest because we'll probably prioritize the order in which we answer them. And then also, as you've already done, participate in the polls. Next slide. So <laughs> I think there's gonna be maybe lag between what I see and what you folks all see. So, um, but let's get started anyway. Farms Under Threat is AFT's multi-year initiative, we started it at least five years ago, to document the status and threats to America's ag lands, while at the same time offering policy solutions. Today we're finding, sharing our findings from the State of the States. About two years ago we released State of America's Farmland, which was the national report. This one is really focused on what's happening within each state, and it's the second in our series. SOS, as I like to call it, paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state and also documents the steps that states have taken to protect and retain their ag land base for working farms and ranches. Next slide. So basically what we did was we used both spatial mapping to identify the threats to ag land and did an in-depth analysis of state policy responses which we showed in an ag land policy scorecard and a bunch of supporting score sheets to bring this research together. Um, and then the purpose is to, to raise awareness 
and to inform state and federal policy action. Although today we're really gonna focus on the state actions. And then ultimately, and I hope this is of interest to all of our land trust participants, to encourage more direct and permanent ag land protection. Jen and, and Mitch are gonna go into much more detail on what we did and how we did it. Um, and so I'm just gonna keep moving. And Mitch, since these slides go quickly, you can kind of maybe anticipate me. But um, the next slide is really just to say that our farmland is really important for lots of things. It provides food security, economic prosperity, and environmental quality. And our goal is to sustain agriculture and its essential roles to society, supporting diverse and resilient agricultural systems that can flourish today, but also for future generations. And we do this, and we do this work not because we want to be chicken little, um, and, but we do want to avoid putting our heads in the sand. And we know that it takes sort of science and objective analysis to get us where we need to go. So again, we don't want to be hysterical about things, but we really do want to take action that's going to make the world a better place. So we seek to learn from what works so we can advance positive change for working farms and ranches all across the US. And as AFT's president, John Piotti, likes to say, a reason to be is to avert catastrophe. So now I'm just gonna briefly outline the, the drivers of conversion. And, and we see this as there being three. And so everybody is gonna expect us to say that poorly planned development is a major driver. And of course it is. And a lot of the presentation today will focus on that. But we also know that weakening agricultural viability and the fact that land is vulnerable when it transfers from a gen one generation to the next are also leading drivers of conversion. Policymakers have been aware of all of these threats for decades, and they've developed a toolbox of policies and programs to respond. But despite all these positive actions, the drivers continue to threaten our land base today. So we'll start with poorly planned development. And, you know, as, as all of you are aware, by the turn of the century, sprawl had become a distinctive landscape feature around most of our cities. And since then, in this century, a combination of economic conditions, the Great Recession, changing consumer preferences, and more compact, smarter growth have slowed conversion of ag land to urban development, which is the development that people have always studied. But low density residential land use, especially in rural regions, has continued to transform the landscape. And this form of land use fragments working farms and ranches, limits management and marketing options, and weakens farm economies, paving the way to urbanization. Mitch is going to tell you much more about that in his presentation. But to me, what is most striking is that we continue to lose farmland over a period when annual housing starts, which is the chart on the left, um, were far lower than they'd been in decades, and population growth also had declined. So you see just visually how these declines occurred um, you know, from the 80s until now. And that even though there was this just huge drop from 2006 to 2008, we really haven't climbed out of it um, yet. And, and who knows now, of course, what's gonna happen after, after the pandemic. But um, you know, even by 2016, the end of our study period, we hadn't climbed out of it. And again, the, the, if you look at the four for decades of growth, our population growth also was low. So next slide. And, and now we sort of move to ag viability. And, and when farmers and ranchers can't make ends meet, they're more likely to sell their land. And that's true for agricultural landowners as well as producers. Input costs are increasing, farm incomes declining, and most farmers now have to rely on off-farm income to stay on their land. A lot of this has been driven and also the result of this has been consolidation and farm sales, which has become nearly universal across commodity crop production with ag income and wealth concentrated on fewer and fewer larger and larger farms. When we talk about consolidation, what we're really talking about is moving from mid-sized family farms to large and very large farms. And as an example of that, according to the Economic Research Service in 2018, 
farms with a million and more of gross farm cash income, income accounted for about 4% of all of the farms, but 46% of the value of production. So the red block in the, in the graph here just shows you again visually how that has been growing since the 1980s and how the, the share of the smaller farms, so the ones in beige, so the red is the larger farms and then the smaller farms, especially in beige with a 250K or less of, of gross farm cash income have been steadily shrinking. What comes with this also is consolidation of cropland. And as farmers consolidate their cropland, they tend to bid up the prices, which intensifies competition for land, removes land from rental markets, and makes it harder for a new generation to enter agriculture. Which leads to the next one of the three threats, which is the impending transfer of land. Today, more than 60% of ranchers and farmers are aged 55 and older. More than four times as many are aged 65 and older as under 35. Um, and the percentage of the senior, this retirement age producers, keeps creeping up. Mitch, we can go to the next slide. This stands in stark contrast to the general workforce, where more than six times as many people are under age, six, uh, under age 35 as over age 65. And so these charts show you in red is the, is the older age in the circle. Um, and so the darker the red, the older the folks. And then in the map, what you're seeing is that in the darker red, five times as many producers are 65 and older as 35 and younger. And in the lowest category, which is the beige, it's only two to three times as many, but it's still disproportionately older to younger. At the same time, including non-operator landlords, 40% of US ag loan is owned by seniors aged 65 and older. And so this transition issue is becoming increasingly acute in this century. And we have to look at it as a driver of farmland conversion, as well as a threat to the future of agriculture in general. In the past, land used to transfer within a farm family sort of through cradle, altar, or grave. Um, but this is less and less true. And today, it, it, most producers don't inherit their land. Um, so land access is a major barrier to entry, for, especially for young, beginning, and socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. So next slide. So in this century, uh, we have a new threat. And so the drivers of conversion reflect threats. But now we also have the threat of climate change. And again, I'm seeing a lag, um, but extreme weather events have increased dramatically over the past 40 years. Floods and droughts and fires and all the other symptoms have been increasing. Food crops like fruits and vegetables are especially vulnerable to climatic stressors and developing ag land exacerbates climate change. Um, it, it's important to keep that final point in mind that ag land producers far fewer GHG emissions than land converted to housing and commercial development. We had a study called Greener Fields in California, which found farmland converted to other uses emits greenhouse gases at a level 58 to 70 times greater than if it had stayed in farming. At the same time, ag land managed with regenerative farming practices, so well, agricultural land can help combat climate change by sequestering carbon in the soil. So bottom line, we need farmland to grow our food and other crops and to provide environmental services, including carbon sequestration. The need for farmland protection has never been more urgent. And now Mitch is gonna take you into all of our incredible mapping Okay, um, I'm just want to make sure somebody maybe on the AFT team can let me know if you can hear me and you can see me. Okay, um, sounds good. Sounds like there's still a lag in the slide, so my apologies for that. I will do my best to adapt as we as we go on from here. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mitch Hunter. I'm the research director at AFT, and I want to thank you all again 
for joining us today. Um, as we get going here on the spatial side of things, I wanted to launch another poll. So uh, if we can launch the poll about conversion and then there it goes. Um, everybody take a second to fill that in. We've got 30 seconds of polling here, I think, and then we'll keep going. I'm seeing the numbers climb and it's amazing. So just hold, hold, hold on a second and we'll show it to the whole group. Um, there's a near consensus, but I won't share any more until we have everybody voted. Okay, I think that everybody can see those now. 94% of you think that low density residential land use is going to be the bigger threat. Um, so I'll get to the results um, in a little bit, a few minutes here, and we'll see if you're right or not. Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, I'm gonna share a little bit about how we did our analysis and then what we found. Um, but before I do, I want to give a big shout out to our friends at Conservation Science Partners, um, who really did the nuts and bolts of this analysis, um, because this work uh, the spatial mapping would not have been possible without them. So many thanks to conservation science partners. Um, and the first step of the analysis was to use advanced uh, spatial modeling tools to map agricultural land use at 10 meter resolution across the lower 48 states. Uh, we did not, we weren't able to include Alaska and Hawaii because the underlying data sets were not available there. Um, and this analysis resulted in the map that you see here or that you're hopefully seeing here if we don't have too bad of a lag. Um, and this map identifies four types of agricultural land, cropland, pasture land, rangeland, and for the first time in a map like this, woodland associated with farms. Uh, we also map BLM and U.S. Forest Service lands that have grazing leases on them. So all told, this is the most comprehensive spatial analysis of US agricultural land ever conducted. And the second step in the analysis was to identify the best agricultural land for producing food and other crops. We did this by creating the first ever index of agricultural land quality that explicitly accounts for productivity, versatility, and resiliency. And we call this the PVR index. This map uh, shows the range of PVR values um, on private agricultural land use across the United States. I'm sorry, on private agricultural land across the United States. Not surprisingly, each state has its own range of PVR values. And that's part of why this index is so powerful. Um, any state can use it to identify their own best land, regardless of uh, the land resources in that state. And we also use the PVR index to identify the best land in the country for producing crops especially human edible food crops. And we call this land nationally significant agricultural land. Um, and while it's concentrated in certain parts of the country, as you can see here, uh, we found that every state has some nationally significant land. Um, and finally, the last step in the analysis was to map the conversion of agricultural lands from 2001 to 2016. We mapped conversion to two types of land use, uh, the first is called Urban and Highly Developed, or UHD, and it's identified using satellite remote sensing. This category includes all the traditional culprits of farmland conversion, uh, expanding residential, commercial, and industrial areas that we've known about for a long time. Um, it's also to note, good to note that this type of land use is largely found in and around cities and towns, but it can also include rural, industrial, and energy production sites such as oil and gas well pads and solar panel installations. Now, the second type of conversion that we looked at um, is one that we've mapped for the very first time in Farms Under Threat. We call it Low Density Residential Land Use, or LDR. And we undertook this analysis to help identify the impacts of large lot housing on the agricultural land base, um, which we know are generally not captured in, in the traditional urban category. Um, LDR areas range, uh, they kind of cover a spectrum ranging from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual houses are being built. 
And as Julian mentioned earlier, this type of scattered large lot housing <clears throat> tends to fragment the agricultural land base and to limit production, marketing, and management options uh, for the working farms and ranches that remain. So in short, when a lot of non-farm neighbors move in, it just gets harder to farm. Overall, we found that development continues to threaten every single state's best agricultural land. And looking at it nationally, from 2001 to 2016, we converted 11 million acres of agricultural land, which is equal to all the land that we use to grow fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Or another way to say it is that on average, every day, 2,000 acres were paved over, built up, or converted to uses that threaten the future of agriculture. Um, and now I'm going to do the big reveal. 94% of you thought that low density residential conversion um, would be the top over urban and highly developed, and you were resoundingly correct. So out of those 11 million acres, um, 4 million were converted to urban and highly developed, and nearly 7 million acres were converted to low density residential land use. Um, so we must have a very sharp on top of it group on the webinar today to be um, so on point with that answer. Not to say that denser conversion of agricultural land is not a problem. It still is, 4 million acres. Um, but we, we have a new focus on, we've been able to bring, we've been able to bring this new threat of low density residential land use into focus with this analysis. Um, and as we know, when all of this agricultural land is converted, it not only threatens our food supply, but it makes it harder for farmers and ranchers, especially new producers, to access the land that they need, and it jeopardizes the environmental benefits that you can get from that land, uh, whether that's clean water, or wildlife habitat, or carbon sequestration. Now, all of these negative effects of farmland conversion are even worse when we convert our best land. And if you remember that category of nationally significant agricultural land, well, from 2001 to 2016, four and a half million acres from that category were, were converted out of the total 11 million acres, um, which really shows that we're just not doing enough to protect our irreplaceable agricultural resources. So um, all of these findings can really be summarized in this one key map. They give a state-by-state -state look at where conversion falls relative to each, each state's land resources. And while some of the patterns may be hard to see at the national scale, I can assure you that they are crystal clear when you zoom in on our detailed maps. Um, these are already available on our interactive website. It launched this morning. And we're also happy to share um, this geospatial data with anyone who would like to use it, uh, especially for land protection or research purposes. So I'm going to launch a new poll right now, um, uh, and you can just chime in if you're interested in getting access to that geospatial data. So um, while the poll's going on, I'm going to keep telling you more about this map. Uh, you can see that the farmland and the rangeland are, divi are divided into the top half and the bottom half of each state's agricultural land, according to our analysis of productivity, versatility, and resiliency. Uh, I kind of think that's easiest to see in Iowa, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, you can see that the land north of Des Moines, um, well, first of all, Iowa has a lot of great land, but nevertheless, we can show that the land north of Des Moines is even better quality than the, the southern part of the state. And this shows, again, that our analysis can be used to help each state identify and protect its most important agricultural resources, even though, they're, even though every state is different. Um, the poll results are in, 93% of the respondents are interested in this data, that's awesome. Um, I believe if you watch the Q&A box, um, Ryan Murphy, who works with me, is going to be putting out the link where you can actually input your information and do a data request to get access to that data. So um, we're really happy to share it and have folks um, make good use of it. Okay, back to describing the map. Um, the red areas show where conversion has occurred whether that's to urban and highly developed or low density residential land use. And you can see that it tends to wrap around existing cities and towns, um, but there are areas where it can extend much further into the countryside, um, especially the low density residential conversion. But it's also important to note that not every acre in red was necessarily paved 
or built on. We know that urban areas have parks and golf courses and even urban agriculture. Um, and we also know that while agriculture is generally compromised in low density residential areas, some farms can adapt by selling products to their new neighbors. Um, but in general, we still remain concerned because we think that, again, the management options are gonna be limited. It tends to escalate land values and that can make it harder to stay in business and especially hard to get started in farming. Um, and I want to just break these numbers down a little bit for you so you can see how they fall out across the state. On an acreage basis, Texas stands out at the top of the list, not surprisingly, given that it's a huge state and has seen very rapid population growth recently. Um, but it's notable that Texas alone converted nearly 1.4 million acres over this time period. Um, beyond Texas, there was a lot of conversion in California, in the Eastern Corn Belt, and especially in the Southeast. And in fact, uh, North Carolina converted the second most acres nationally, even though it's only 30th in total agricultural acreage. When you look at this in terms of the percent of each state's agricultural land that was converted, you can see that the East Coast and the South stand out again. Um, New Jersey is the leading state, having converted nearly 9% of its ag land. And as the most densely populated state in the country, that's not too surprising. Um, but again, North Carolina and its neighbors in the Southeast had high, con high percent conversion rates, despite being much larger and more sparsely populated. What's striking to me about all this is that at these conversion rates, by 2100, five states will have converted a third or more of their agricultural land. That includes North Carolina, Connecticut, and Delaware, as well as New Jersey. Finally, I want to share with you our list of the top 12 most threatened states. This list um, and the way we scored it combines acres and percent because they're both important. And that's why we have Texas, North Carolina, and New Jersey all clustered at the top, even though they face very different types of threats. Um, one way to think about these different threats is that converting a lot of acres is bad for the nation and bad for the world. Um, whereas converting a high percentage of a state's land is bad for the resilience of that state's food system. Um, and we've all seen how critical food system resilience can be in times of crisis. Uh, luckily, there are plenty of tools that states can use to help keep their land in working farms and ranches. Um, so on that note, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Jen Dempsey, and she will tell you more about our policy analysis. Great, thanks, Mitch. And before we get started, Wendy, I'm hoping you can launch the next poll question. So there it is, we'll give this about 20 seconds. Great, so the results are in. And interestingly, this, this lines up pretty well with results from our own prioritization process when we were determining how we were gonna meet policies and programs in our agricultural land protection scorecard. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that coming up. So if we could get started now, Mitch, with the next slide. So in tandem with our spatial analyses, AFT was conducting research on programs and policies that protect agricultural land, support viability, and ensure land is available for current and future farmers and ranchers. And this work resulted in the Agricultural Land Protection Scorecard. We analyzed six programs and policies that are tied to the land and have been implemented in at least 10 states. We used both quantitative and qualitative factors to measure program performance and also to highlight some of the effective provisions and practices. The results are summarized in individual policy score sheets and then we rolled up the scores from each score sheet into a single policy response score. 
the combined scores are presented in the Agland Protection Scorecard and they serve as a broad indicator of each state's overall policy response to the threat. So the purpose of the scorecard and the supporting score sheets is really to wait, raise awareness about effective approaches, inform state and federal policy action, and to encourage more ag land protection. For the initial round of the scorecard, we examined, as I said, six policies and programs. We started with purchase of ag conservation easement programs that permanently protect farmland and ranch land from non-farm development. It's also called purchase of development rights in some places. PACE programs compensate landowners who voluntarily place an ag conservation easement on their property. Sometimes they're administered soup to nuts by a public entity and other times a public entity is giving funds to a land trust to actually do the deals. We also reviewed land use planning policies that manage growth and stabilize the land base. Most states, as you know, delegate planning authority to local governments, but some states like Oregon and Washington play a much more active role. They may have state goals around protecting agricultural land. They may also require localities to develop comprehensive plans that are aligned with those goals and require localities to identify ag resources and adopt policies to protect them. We also assess property tax relief programs that reduce property taxes paid on agricultural land. Here, the most common approach was use value assessment programs, which assess farmland and ranch land at its value for agriculture. We also looked at agricultural district programs. These encourage landowners to form special areas to support agriculture. And farmers receive protections and incentives that can include limits on annexation, limits on eminent domain, protection from the siting of public facilities and infrastructure, and tax benefits, all in exchange for enrollment. And some incorporate a term easement um, when landowners enroll. Farmlink programs are another approach that we looked at. They connect land seekers with landowners who want their land to stay in agriculture. They offer a range of services and resources that include online real estate listings, technical assistance, trainings, and educational resources. For the purposes of our state policy scorecard, we only looked at the publicly supported programs. And then finally, we considered state leasing programs that are making state-owned land available to farmers and ranchers for agriculture. So there were several steps in our process um, to select the policies. We interviewed farmland protection professionals, and we also reviewed the available literature. We initially looked at nine policies, but ultimately limited our analysis to six that I just described. They were all tied to the land and they had been adopted by at least 10 states. We developed factors to measure program performance. In the end, we ended up with 39 factors across the six approaches. Most were qualitative, um, but we also had about a dozen quantitative factors. And this is where we calculated values using available data and then it created brackets and assigned points. We also, in the next phase, reviewed state laws, rules, and implementation materials and conducted surveys and interviewed program managers. And this research was conducted primarily between 2016 and 2019. And then our last steps were just calculating the scores and conducting some analyses based on these scores. And I'll go into a little more detail on the next slide. So in order to combine scores for the individual policies, we needed to figure out the relative importance or weight of each policy. We decided to survey 20 experts. We included some AFT staff, but actually more external ex experts. And then we asked them to rank each approach. And using this information, we assigned the weights that are shown in the right column. 
Respondents ranked pace and land use planning as the most important approaches. In our process, they ended up being tied. Today, it was, it was really fascinating to see the land use planning actually edged out um, pace. So those two account for about a third of the overall policy response score. So just keep that in mind as we go along. This step was critical because it allowed us to generate that one overall value that is serving as a, just a broad indicator of each state's policy response. And then we used that policy response score to evaluate the type of development that was driving state action, the effectiveness of key approaches at curb conversion, and then how state policy responses were com were compared to the degree of threat. And Julia is actually going to describe that comparison later in the presentation. So we summarized all of our results in the Ag Land Protection Scorecard. This is the version that you would see in the printed report. The microsite that Mitch was talking about that allowed you to zoom in on maps has also has the scorecard, all of the score sheets, but it's in a slightly different format, different presentation. Um, for this scorecard, you can see that each of the six policies is a row heading. So it's over in that far left column. In the second column, we're showing the weight that each policy was given. And then you can read down the columns that are headed by um, the postal codes, just to see the score earned by a single state across each policy. And then we combined the policy response score is pictured there in that second to last row that has the red circle around it. And finally, again, because the scores are really just meant to be a broad indicator of state's policy response. And you can see that in some cases, we either had ties or very close neck and neck races between states. We ended up grouping states into quartiles. And that's shown in that last, that last row of the table. Now we're going to look at some of the findings. So this map is showing states overall policy response by quartile. So the darker the blue, the higher the policy response. What is immediately evident is that every state has taken steps to protect their agricultural land and to support agricultural viability. All 50 states have enacted property tax relief programs. All states have authorized local governments to plan and implement local land use regulations. Nearly every state has a program to lease state-owned land for agriculture, and more than half have PACE programs. And even the least widespread approach, which is FarmLink, is found in 11 states. But the bad news is <laughs> that the combined scores range from a high of 59 in New Jersey to a low of five in Arkansas. So clearly there is a lot of potential to do more and states really must do more. So only Virginia and New Jersey had adopted the full suite of programs that we examined and no state earned a perfect score for any single policy. So that's just pointing out that there's, there's all this opportunity um, to do more if state lawmakers and advocates choose to address the issue. They could adopt more policies or they could make use of what they already have on the books and adapt it to include provisions that are really meant to protect agricultural land. So when we examined the policy scores, and we ranked states by their overall policy response score. We found these top 12 leaders. And you probably noticed on the previous map that the top 12 states were clustered on the coast. On the east coast, there's a concentration between Maryland and Vermont, and that's where we have some of the nation's leading PACE programs. All of the west coast states plus Hawaii landed in the top 12 as well. But on this coast, land use planning was a stronger approach. All of the high responders tended to be densely populated and or to experience double digit population growth 
over the, a period of time when they were enacting these policies. In fact, we performed a regression analysis and we found a very strong relationship between the proportion of agricultural land developed, which Mitch was talking about earlier, and the policy re response score. So as the percentage of agricultural land lost to development increased, so did their overall policy response according to the policy response score. And this is just suggesting to us that it's that intensity or concentration of development rather than the extent or total amount of development that was spurring states to take action. And then finally, among the same sort of top 12 leaders that you just saw, we found that coordination was really key. They were linking multiple programs and they were creating state policy frameworks that were geared at harnessing local effort and directing and guiding local efforts. So in general, states with multiple policies, especially PACE and strong land use planning were receiving, receiving the highest combined scores these two bar charts that you see are showing policy scores for two states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. The state's scores are represented by the green bar, and then they're being compared to the median and top scores earned among all the states implementing that approach, which are in shades of blue. So at a glance, you see that both states have used multiple approaches, and adopting more than one approach is very effective because the strengths of one policy or program can offset limitations of another. You can also note that it is not necessary to use all of the approaches. You'll see that Pennsylvania, which is among our top five leading programs, does not at this point in time have a publicly sponsored farm link program, but they're still doing a great job. So we're not trying to be prescriptive, we are just trying to highlight and share good ideas and approaches among states. In addition, we found that these leaders were linking the different policies and programs to increase their effectiveness. So Delaware and Pennsylvania, for example, require enrollment in agricultural districts to be eligible for PACE. That helps them assemble blocks of contiguous land ahead of per permanent protection. And in addition, the review and approval process for districts just streamlines and speeds up the easement application process. Meanwhile, in Maryland, Michigan, New York, farmland protection planning helps inform comprehensive plans, and it's also linked to funding for PACE. So that's ensuring that state investment and permanent protection is lining up with local land use planning. And finally, effective programs tend to establish statewide goals, which I've already mentioned. Um, you see it in the context of PACE programs, like the ones you have in Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, which have state ranking criteria. Local governments have some flexibility within the framework, but they are still working toward achieving statewide goals. In the arena of planning, we have the outstanding planning programs in Oregon and Washington which are requiring local consistency with state goals to achieve larger outcomes. So with that, I'm gonna hand back to Julia to provide an overview of our call to action. Thanks, Jen. Um, I was trying to turn my video on, but, but for some reason it's just blocked. So. You're going to be stuck with my voice. Um, I think we're going to do another poll now uh, just to try to take this into maybe a larger world perspective. Um, and it's really just a question about, you know, we know that our ag land and, and a lot of the focus of this report has been on ag land that's well suited for intensive food and crop production. Um, so we know that ag land is sort of the factory floor, floor for our food system. Um, and we're wondering whether, you know, in the face of, of COVID-19 and everything else going on these days, how many of you are concerned about disruptions to our food supply?
Great. Well, yes. So, so are we. <laughs> and um, before COVID, we were especially focused on climate change. And, and now we realize that it's, it's um, maybe even a more complex situation than, than we had realized. Um, so let's go to the, the next slide, Mitch, the rubric slide. So as Jen mentioned, we pulled our major findings together into a rubric <clears throat> or this is what we call it a rubric it may be not the most beautiful thing in the world but we we, we find that it's an effective way to show um, the how the threat of ag land conversion over this period has compared to the policy response so the degree of threat runs horizontally um, the higher threat states are in the boxes on the right um, the extent of the policy response runs vertically the high response states are in the boxes at the top and what you can see is that a lot of the southern states ended up in that bottom red box. Um, Texas, I'll just point out Texas, because um, in Mitch's slide, you could see that it was sort of the biggest loser in terms of, of acres. Um, but it's not at the very bottom of the box. It's towards the top of that red box because it has had some policy response, just clearly not enough to be commensurate with the amount of threat. And then if you look at the very top, you have New Jersey, which we've talked about, which is the most, the most highly um, densely populated state. And they've had you know, tremendous development pressure, but also um, a reciprocally very high policy response. So that's sort of how we hope states can kind of take a look at this um, to inform sort of where they're at on that spectrum and what more they need to do. Um, the state, as Jen had mentioned, the states that have a high threat and high policy response have been working on this for decades. Um, but even in cases where they have relatively wide policy adoption, even the leaders have more work to do. And this is especially true because new policy approaches are needed to respond to LDR conversion. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating um, how much the, the audience had, had recognized that LDR really has become this, this leading threat in the 21st century. And unlike UHD, it's not strongly driven by population growth, um, and this is likely due to weak land use regulations. So, so based on this, and based on all of this amazing data that, that Jen and, and Mitch have shared, um, you know, both on what's happening on the ground and also what has been happening in state houses, um, we, we have come up with five sort of broad actions that states can take. And the first one, um, next slide, um, is really based on the idea that you can't manage what you don't measure. So effective strategies are based on solid, solid data and on science. Toward that end, states really need to track their own agricultural land use trends and conditions. And we hope that our work will help but most states have their own GIS capacity and they could use that and build on it to enhance their soils data with their own criteria to map the importance of their ag lands. And they, while our LDR analysis wasn't able to account for the myriad of local land use regulations across the US, this is something that states can do on their own and collect the necessary data so that they understand where you see LDR patterns, what has been a de deliberate response and what is not. Um, in terms of mapping, um, California actually has a great California farmland mapping and monitoring program. For, so for anybody who's sort of looking for a really good example of what states can do, um, we talk about it in our report and it's, it's a really good example. Uh, next slide. Great. Um, <laughs> so, States need to address their agricultural trends and conditions with clear goals and a suite of coordinated policies. And that's what we've learned from the leaders. So we recommend that they start by looking for opportunities within what they've already got, within the policies and the programs they've already got. Um, so for example, while our research shows that, that every state has some kind of land use planning authority and that strong land use planning effectively curbs ag land conversion, most states could strengthen their authority by requiring consistency and coordination with local governments. And they should call for measures, specific measures to protect their ag land and direct growth to urbanized areas within existing infrastructure and affordable transportation and housing options. 
And then on the other side, since sort of land use planning and, and pace ended up rising up as the high sort of the highest weighted policies, um, 29 states have funded ag easement purchases, but just the top five, just five together, were responsible for more than a third of the total acres protected. So we think that states really can strengthen their PACE programs by in incorporating a partnership structure, and that might increase their capacity. It could be between the state and local governments or qualified entities like local land trusts. They can increase their acquisition rates by having dedicated sources of funding, and they can improve affordability with an option to acquire protected land at ag value or incorporating affirmative farming provisions. These are just some of the examples from our report, but long and short, to combat angland conversion, states need both carrots and sticks. So a suite of coordinated policies which at once support agriculture and reduce the threats to agricultural land. So that comes to the supporting ag piece of this, right? And they need to find ways to improve the viability of their agricultural sector and facilitate transfer to a new an increasingly diverse generation of farmers and ranchers. A handful have farm viability programs that help producers with business planning and in some cases farm transfer planning and grant funding for capital improvements. And I think Jen had mentioned that we had originally looked at, at nine policies. Farm viability policies were one of them, but we didn't have 10 states that had adopted them. So we have done a lot of research on them, but we didn't include them in the scorecard. Um, other states have things like Maryland's Ag and Resource-Based Industry Development Corporation, or MARBITCO, which actually explicitly addresses ag land, I mean, agricultural development. So agriculture is economic development. And then increasingly, states are supporting farm transfer by helping young and beginning farmers gain access to land. Even without public authority, Jen mentioned only 11 states have their own farm link programs, but there are 30 more private farm link programs and states can provide funding to support those. Um, or they can make more land available for leasing through their leasing programs. And finally, they can use other, other tools like beginning farmer tax credits or leveraging PACE programs to facilitate transfer to a new generation. Which leads to planning for agriculture. Um, and as the old adage goes, a failure to plan is a plan to fail. State and local governments plan for many things from transportation and affordable housing to economic development, but very few of them plan for food or agriculture. And this really, really needs to change. So planning for ag can occur at a state level, regional, local level. It can be a standalone plan, it can be part of a comp plan or some other kind of plan. States can develop their own plans or just provide resources to support local governments in their planning efforts. New York, for example, has a farmland protection planning grants program to do this. Um, finally, states should devise emergency management plans. And this is part of the reason I asked that question at the beginning of, the, of this section. Um, to address the resiliency of their agricultural sector. The, you know, the coronavirus has made this painfully obvious, but these plans really have to address climate change, integrating agriculture into other resiliency efforts, and you know, whether those are related to transportation and housing or food system and sustainability planning. And finally, we have to save the best, but we can't forget the rest. So states need to become more sophisticated in how they assess, prioritize, and protect their vital agricultural resources. Special efforts should be made to protect the nationally significant ag land, which is so critical for long-term food security and environmental quality. Policy action is needed both to stop development on this nationally significant land and to protect it in perpetuity. But since our PVR analysis covers the full range of land quality. It can be used to prioritize land in any state. So please use the interactive maps on our Farms Under Threat website, to find actionable information on the location and the quality of our ag land and the threats posed by development and where your highest threats converge with your best quality lands. At the same time, it's important to remember that lesser quality soils also provide multiple co-benefits. For example, rangelands not well suited for intensive food and crop production 
but it provides valuable forage for livestock. It supports meat and fiber production and is critical habitat for wildlife. And when it's managed with regenerative systems, it can lessen the impacts of climate change by increasing carbon in the soil, offering a valuable resource to mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. So just to close, while agriculture confronts the threats described in our report, consumers' expectations for plentiful, high quality food keep increasing. And part of this trend is towards local food or food grown close to market using short supply chains within states or regions where farmers also perform value added functions. Most of this food is produced on small farms within 100 miles of metro areas, farms that are increasingly threatened. To meet this demand, farmers are gonna to have to balance the challenges and the opportunities of farming in metro and adjacent communities. As this chart depicts, these areas supply most of the fruits, vegetables, nuts, dairy, and poultry that we eat. Given the empty shelves that consumers have encountered with COVID-19, we expect consumer desire for local food and regional food systems will keep continuing to grow. So we see COVID-19 really just as a wake-up call. Even as we deal with the repercussions of this crisis, we have to prepare for the next, especially climate change. Farming and farmland play a key role. Yet while we take those essential steps, we must build the resilient food systems that are, that are future demands. It takes regionally diverse and sometimes redundant food systems to support the growing and increasingly complex public demands from agriculture. To ensure this resiliency as well as prosperity, every state needs to secure a critical mass of high quality farmland support ag viability, and a new generation of farmers and ranchers, while at the same time promoting regenerative practices to build healthy soil and combat climate change. We know this will take collaboration and coordinated action. We hope that you will join us. And with that, I think we can turn to Mitch. Mitch, um, a lot of people wanted to see some of our data, so take it away. Yeah, hi again, everybody. Um, I'm gonna leave my video off for a minute so that I can um, switch my screen over to the microsite. If you haven't, and I'm gonna stop using that term, it's, it's our interactive website. Um, if you haven't seen our interactive website yet, um, you can go to this URL that's on the page. Um, and I also just wanna make a note too that we are getting close to Q&A time. And so if you haven't yet mm -hmm. asked a question, um, if you, um, if you haven't yet asked a question and you'd like to, or you'd like to go and see what other questions people have put in there um, so you can vote them up, um, please do so. We are gonna be addressing the questions with the most votes first. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to switch the screen that I'm sharing. And if it's not working, somebody please let me know. But this is just a little quick preview of our website. Um, it, it's set up with four tabs. So on the first tab, um, that's a welcome page. It'll show you, or it'll give you a, a really quick overview of what we did and what we found. Um, and if you scroll down to the bottom, I wanted to point out in case anybody has challenges with navigating the site, we have information here on how to do that. So both for the spatial mapping tab and for the policy scorecard tab, you'll be able to um, get some help with navigation. If you go to those tabs, you can also get that navigation help with this button right here. Um, this is the map, it's interactive. Uh, you can click and zoom in. I'm gonna choose my home state here of Minnesota. Um, and I imagine that the, um, that the projection of this to all of you might have a bit of a lag, but it's very responsive. You can zoom in to a high level of detail mm -hmm. as you can see here. Um, and another other things you can do with this map, you can change the layer that you're looking at. So if you want to look at the land cover and use, um, see where the agricultural land lies in your state, you can do it that way. Uh, you can also choose a map of our PVR values. Um, and then you can choose a map that shows which lands we designate as nationally significant. And there's a lot of statistics to the side and below the map um, that are 
specific to an individual state and they change when you change states. So if I go up here and I say I want to learn about Arkansas, uh, all these statistics will shift and I'll get the Arkansas specific information. There's also, I'm not going to click on it, um, but if you click on this button here, you will get a, a one page or back and front summary of our, our, of our information for any state. Um, if you ever don't see that button, it's probably because you've got the entire country selected. So you just have to go ahead and select a state and then you'll get that button. The policy scorecard tab is set up pretty similar, although um, of course the information is different, so it's not exactly the same. But again, we have our navigation help button. Um, you can see that I was clicking on Arkansas before, and so we still have Arkansas highlighted um, on the space or on the policy tab as well. Uh, but if you don't have a, that state highlighted and you click one, it will go right to the scores for that state. So um, Jen showed a couple examples of these bar charts in her presentation. They're all here on the microsite as well. And if you want to download the summary for an individual state, you can go ahead and do that with this button. Um, finally, we've got uh, the actual scorecard and score sheets here on the microsite or on the interactive website. So they're available to you to, to explore. If, um, when they first come up, you'll see that they're sorted with the highest at the top. Um, and they're gonna be sorted by this kind of rolled up score on the right. So we have New Jersey at the top here. If we wanna sort alphabetically, we can click on the state name. If we wanna see who got the highest score for PACE, uh, we can click on that or we can look at any of the other program areas. Now, if you really wanna dig in deep and understand, okay, how did we score property tax relief and what did we find? Um, all you have to do is go to the dropdown. It'll give you a brief summary of, of what that is. And then we'll have the score sheets, which again are gonna be sorted um, with the leaders at the top. You can sort and look at each of these columns. And if you want to understand how we scored these different factors, all you have to do is scroll to the bottom and we've got all of that scoring information down here at the bottom as well. Finally, um, the call to action tab uh, really just encapsulates what we're calling on states to do. It includes a copy of this image um, and, and just a summary of, of what we're calling on states to do. Uh, and I guess I shouldn't have said finally because there's one more important piece if you are looking for information, um, especially more technical information, or the report itself, you can go up to reports and data. You can get the full report, copy of our glossary from the report, um, the scorecard, uh, detailed scorecard and score sheets in Excel, and a number of other, and a number of other resources up there as well. So there's really a ton to explore. I hope that you all do. Um, please let me know if there are any issues that come up. You can find my email on the AFT website. Um, and for now, uh, I think we're going to flip back and we're going to do some Q&A um, that has come in. And now I do see we've got quite a bit of good um, questions and upvoted questions on the list. So I'm going to turn it back over to Julia to lead us through that Q&A. That sounds great. Thanks, Mitch. Um, and I hope everybody's as excited as we are about having what, what we've been calling the microsite, but the interactive website up and live along with the report and, and a lot of materials that people can use for their individual states as well as, as to get a sense of, of what we found overall. So now I'm going to start with the, the question that had the most thumbs up. And I think this one, Mitch, is for you um, as the scientist in the group which is how does the threats to response matrix interact with timeline? Um, in other words, Washington, Oregon seem to score well, um, low threat, high response. Um, showing, so is that showing a result of policy? They have a low threat because of their good response or policy responses analyzed that started over the time period that the threat analysis was based. So maybe you could answer sort of how you did the matrix and I'm happy to speak a little bit to Washington and Oregon. Yeah, that's, a, that's great, Julia. Um, please do jump in. I just flipped back in the slides to show that, that image that's being asked about. Um, and yeah, the, the questioner is exactly right. We see a, Oregon and Washington really standing out here. Um, and I think that there are a few factors that go into it. Those are two states that have had 
um, a really strong policy response, and it's been longstanding. And so I think we can, um, in, in large part, applaud those two states for having done a very good job. And that's not to say that their work is done by any means. Um, again, every state can do more, um, and the threats are always evolving. So um, there's more work to be done, but it is, I think, important to note that there are longstanding approaches to really strong uh, land use planning that's driven at the state level, but also then coordinated with local level governments um, has been relatively effective. Um, that being said, there are some uh, nuances to the way that this um, threat score is calculated that uh, come into play here. So both Oregon and Washington are pretty large states with a lot of agricultural land. And that means that um, when we look at the percent of conversion, that their percent conversion is lower. Um, maybe one way to think about it is you've got a lot of development or development pressure in the coastal area of New Jersey and the coastal area of Oregon and Washington. But um, New Jersey doesn't have, you know, millions of acres of inland area that don't have that same development pressure to kind of balance it out in terms of that percentage, whereas Oregon and Washington do have those large areas of inland agriculture to balance it out. Um, so I think to me what that points to is, yes, we need state level policies. We need to try to understand where, where, where states stand as a state as a whole, but we also know that so much of this work is local um, and depends on, uh, you know, local passion, local energy, and, and local interest to, to really take the steps to address the hotspots because there are hotspots in both Oregon and Washington where conversion is occurring, um, and we can't, we can't slacken off just because on a statewide basis they're doing pretty well. Um, Julia, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, that was a very thorough answer. <laughs> um, so I don't think so, although I would, uh, maybe two quick points. Um, one is you're absolutely right, Oregon passed its Growth Management Act in the early 1970s, so they've had a large a large time frame to be dealing with this. Um, I think they also are now confronting this issue of LDR and realize they probably need some new solutions. Um, the other thing about Oregon that I think really stood out to us in the research was that they have very, very good coordination between the state and what the local government is doing. And that's part of why some of our recommendations really encourage that very strong relationship. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and go to the next question, um, which is, what is our definition of large lot size? And I think, Mitch, you probably want to take this one, too. Sure. Um, and I'm also trying to turn my video back on to see, hopefully, we have the bandwidth to carry that. Um, let me know if you're having any troubles with, uh, with audio or anything else as a result. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And we explicitly vary our definition of large lot size across the country. There's two ways to think about this as far as how it applies to our analysis. Um, the, basically, how do we define this low density residential? And at the low end, the first question is, what's the line between urban and highly developed and low density residential? Um, and that, that number is not hard and set in stone um, because there's a ton of variability across the country. Um, and even in the, the data that we pull in and use to define the urban and highly developed category, it's a little bit variable. But roughly speaking, um, that urban category will capture housing density up to around one house per acre, um, maybe one house per acre and a half, depending. Um, so that's kind of the, the high end of a lot size that we would call urban. And in this analysis, the low density residential will just go higher than that. So let's say from an acre um, up to, depending on where you are in the country, um, it could be quite large. And we knew that we needed to be sensitive to the way that agriculture is different across the country. Um, essentially, what we had to do was take a guess at what level of housing density um, means that agriculture is probably no longer viable or highly compromised. Um, but that's gonna be different in uh, New England 
where there's a lot of smaller farms um, that are you know more dispersed across the landscape um, and you can really have a viable farm and there are lots of viable farms that are an acre or two acres or three acres um, it's very different than if you're in west texas where to really have a viable ag operation you probably need at least hundreds of acres if not thousands and so we got some data from the census of agriculture and i'll spare you the boring details but we essentially found a way to tailor that to all the different conditions across the country um, it's never going to be perfect but it was a big improvement over just taking um, you know a uniform approach across the country i think i think that's the best way to encapsulate it um, just like with any of these questions if something is not clear first of all you can go to our website read our report um, and I'm always happy to respond to emails as well. So the next question is, um, <laughs> I'm noticing that most states with the most ag land protection policies also have some of the most expensive housing markets. How do you ensure that ag land protection programs don't contribute to the nation's housing affordability crisis? Uh, Jen, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so one of the most successful PACE programs is actually a dual purpose. It's the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. So the state intentionally set out to at the same time address both of those issues at once, recognizing that if they were developing a healthy stock of affordable housing, they could also be helping to prevent some sort of sprawl in rural areas and concentrating um, redevelopment of urban centers and it would help all at once also protect their farmland. So they have this really nice dual purpose program that's providing state funding for both purposes to revitalize um, housing opportunities in more developed community centers and also providing funding for the purchase of ag conservation easements. So that's definitely one successful approach that has then served as a model for some programs in um, Connecticut and Massachusetts. I think that maybe I'll just add to that a little bit and, and go back to a point that I think has been made quite a bit, which it also comes down to good planning. Um, because when you do good planning, you balance all of the essential needs of society. And I think that when you, when you encourage compact development um, close to infrastructure and services, um, you can foster more affordable housing um, without it sort of sprawling out into the countryside where maybe there isn't infrastructure, services, jobs, and so on. So I think you know every state, every community really has to take this on themselves. But I don't think that we should ever pit farmland protection against affordable housing. I think as Jen is saying, um, we should look to examples like Vermont where they have looked at them as like one constituency and, and do the work together. So the next question is how can local and regional land trusts work most collaboratively with AFT to create the greatest synergies for land protection. And I wish we actually had Chris Coffin here to answer that question, but I will take a crack at it, which is we have launched a new national ag land network. Um, and that's exactly what we want to do is work more collaboratively um, with local and regional land trusts and also with other people involved in the field. Um, they might be in PACE programs, they might be planners. Um, so that we can actually build kind of a critical mass of people working together to address these issues. Um, and if you want more information about that after, um, we'll have information on our website. There's information about the network in our report and um, we can put you directly in touch with Chris. So the next question that I see here coming up and, and again, maybe I'll kick this one back to Mitch, um, although maybe we'll all have slightly different answers, um, is, is there a definition, is there a nailed down definition of regenerative agriculture? Yeah, I'm happy to try to address that. Um, oh, look, I, I got a video. Woohoo! Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> 
and I think I am as well, though I'm my 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 audio is over phone, so it's kind of disconnected. So I might not be popping up for people, but you don't need to see my face. It's fine. Um, and Jen, uh, you can come in now. <laughs> um, in terms of a definition of regenerative ag, um, it, you know, it's one of those things where probably everybody has their own definition. The way I think about it is that the notion of regenerative is an evolution of sustainable, in that the sense that sustainable was a concept thing, we need to stop doing bad things. Uh, we need to stop degrading our resources. We need to stop polluting the environment. Um, and that's super important, obviously. But to me, regenerative takes it the next step and says, it's not just about stopping the bad stuff. We need to make our resource space better. Uh, we need to continue improving it. Um, and that can be, and I think this is one that people focus on a lot, that can be putting a lot more carbon back into the soil. That's an important one. Um, but it can also be improving biodiversity, creating uh, wildlife habitat on farms. Um, you know, it can, it can cover a wide range. Of course, improving water quality, getting water quality across the country back up to where it needs to be as far as being able to swim in our lakes and rivers and streams and fish in them as well. Um, so improving the quality of our resource, I think, is the sense of we're going to regenerate it I'm just going to continue to sustain us over time um, because we're doing things like the soil health principles, or we're keeping soil covered, um, keeping more perennials on the landscape, uh, having diverse crop rotations, and minimizing the amount that we disturb the soil, adding um, carbon inputs. So there's all kinds of, of different ways um, to think about how we address regenerative agriculture. Um, in my opinion, keeping plants on the ground 365 days a year as much as we can is really the key one, um, but there's lots of ways to address it. And I think lots of definitions, but they all revolve around the idea of really making an improvement. Great, thank you, Mitch. So the next question is maybe kind of related and it's, is AFT doing any work in the arena, whoop, skipping around, oh, there we go, of lobbying um, towards payments for ecosystem services beyond the CSP program or the California CDFA Healthy Soils Initiative. And um, I don't, I, I'm not the right person to speak towards our lobbying efforts, um, being not a lobbyist myself, but um, AFT has been very involved with looking into the role of ecosystem services for a long time and think that there's a lot of promise in them and certainly has done a lot of work in terms of policy development and advocacy around CSP and the California CDFA Healthy Soils Initiative. So, um, you know, taking the word lobbying maybe out of it, I would say that yes, this is an area of, of real interest to AFT and, and one that I think we think holds great promise. And Mitch, I don't know if you wanna throw anything into that mix. Yeah, just a, a couple things. Um, you know, I think that our this idea is definitely part of our suite of federal policy ideas for the upcoming farm bill, which we're already starting to work on. Um, there's so many different ways to do it, and we, we already do it in a lot of ways um, through federal programs. So those can continue to be strengthened. Um, but we also have some great on the ground work trying to figure out how do we do this in the private sector as well because we know that there are, plenty of, um, there are plenty of companies out there who are looking to improve their own environmental footprint for whatever reason, and they might want to buy carbon credits, they might want to buy water quality credits, they might want to buy credits for wildlife habitat, pollinator habitat, a wide range. And so the real trick is to link up the farmers who want to do that on their operations with the companies that want to buy those credits and make it an economical system. Um, that's been going on for a while. We were involved in the first um, water quality trading system in the country with, with farmers, and that was in the Ohio River watershed. Um, and we've, we've got more and more of that work going on on the ground as well. So very interesting, very exciting direction that we definitely need to head in more aggressively, I think. Thanks. So the next question is, is, is maybe part question, part statement. Um, um, which reads, not that we shouldn't try to discourage LDR development, but maybe we should focus um, on educating and encouraging LDR landowners 
to practice conservation measures like pollinator, pollinator conservation plantings, carbon sequestration measures, decreased chemical applications, et cetera. So, um, so yes, um, I would say yes, we should discourage our development, but we also should um, encourage people who do move into more rural areas and, and adjacent to farms, um, not only to practice better conservation themselves, which absolutely I agree with. Um, and I think, you know, doing pollinator work is great. Um, but also that I think that when you, when you get back to this sort of idea of planning for agriculture, especially at the local level, to make sure that we have policies in place that when p new people move into town, they're notified that they're moving in next to a farm, that you put buffers between farms and new development. But I think there are a whole lot of things that we can do um, so that LDR uh, doesn't, doesn't cause some kind of crisis, you know, that we can try to find some way to balance um, some of these development patterns that, that are going to continue to happen, um, to come up with policies to try to limit them happening, um, but also to make sure that they're more compatible with the agriculture and the natural systems um, in which the new neighbors are, are coming in and moving into. And I don't know, Jen, if you want to throw anything into that mix. Or no, Matt. I, think, I think you summed it up pretty well. So the next question, which goes back a little bit um, you know, maybe we're poking you a little, Mitch, on, on um, our LDR definition, but it's, was the average farm size part of the national census of ag used? And um, yes, we did use census data, but I think I'm going to let either Jen or Mitch answer specifically how we use the census data in our LDR analysis. Yeah, so Julia, I, Mitch, I just was posting a response to that, which we did use that we used the distribution of farm sizes from the 2017 Census of Agriculture. We submitted a special tabulation request, received that information. Um, we were not paying attention to the average farm size. We started out by looking at the median, but then over time, when we were doing our analyses, we decided to pick a much more conservative point on the distribution of farm size. And I think, Mitch, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we ended up at like the 10th percentile. So in other words, 90% of the farms in a given county would be at or above that level that we, we ended up using to inform our LDR analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just want to give kudos to Michelle who asked that question. Very insightful. You nailed it. That's exactly the data source that we went to and um, Jen described it very well. So um, the next one that came up and I wish, I don't know if we can turn the speaker on <laughs> because I'd love um, Jim to actually speak to this himself, but um, Jim Johnson, if, if it's the one that I think it is, it's from Oregon and saying that LDR is especially a problem where smart growth focused on urban areas is practiced. And I think that's just an incredibly important and interesting observation. Um, I don't know, Wendy, if there's any way that we can turn on the mic and let Jim speak. I, I think that um, my understanding is that Oregon is about to release or maybe just released a new report called Death by a Thousand Cuts about the kind of development pattern that actually is happening even in a state that we uphold or lift up as one that's done really an extraordinarily good job of, of curbing development um, using their, their land use planning. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, even in places that are doing a really great job, there's still a new century and more to do. So, I don't know if we can let Jim speak, but oh, Jim, Jim is, I think we, I asked him to unmute, and so he should be able to speak. Yes, so, if you would, yes, please share some some um, wisdom with us. Sure. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, um, I'm Jim Johnson. I'm the land use uh, specialist for the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Um, been involved in Oregon's land use planning program for gosh, I don't know, 30, 40 years now. Um, 
you know, we're famous for our urban growth boundaries. We're famous for our exclusive farm use zoning outside of urban growth boundaries. But what we've found is um, even with the tools that we have, um, there's, there's still an awful lot of pressure from both uh, LDR and other non-farm development. And I think that's exasperated by the fact that we do such a good job in our urban areas with efficient use and such that uh, there are a lot of people that are looking to, um, to, to, to cite that LDR or that non-farm development um, outside in rural areas. And um, we're especially of late having issues with recreational development, um, including some related to agriculture, some agritourism that's uh, where the tail's wagging the dog, so to speak, and also energy facility siting. Um, uh, I think that where Oregon could do better here is um, requiring better uh, situations outside of urban growth boundaries where alternative analyses are done um, similar to what you're talking about um, in your report, we do a high value farmland versus other farmland, um, but we're still learning there. So um, my biggest concern in Oregon is cumulative impact of non-farm development outside of urban growth boundaries, not urban growth. Thank you so much. And I think um, for all of us, there's a lot that we can learn from Oregon. And it, it seems that, you know, sometimes when you solve one problem, <laughs> there's an associated new problem that needs to be solved. And, and I will continue to look to Oregon for, for solving some of those problems, because I know that you don't think that you've done enough. And, and we all, you know, we, we certainly have come forward and said that no state has actually done enough, but you've done a very good job. I, so I totally far. agree. So... <laughs> Okay, so um, the next question, um, is are there any recommendations on preventing or limiting foreign interests from purchasing farmland and farms? And um, the answer to that is simple, no, that, um, that's just not something that we looked into in this, in this report. And um, I think now we're, we're kind of getting down to the end unless anybody has new ones um, and the, the last one, oh, somebody has their hand up. Um, can somebody, I'm not sure how I manage that. Can somebody else help us with the person with their hand up? Mitch, do you see the hand up? I do. Um, I'm gonna allow Jeremiah Cosgrove to talk, I, um, I think. I think um, I Mar uh, Margo was first. She's, been, she's had her okay. hand up for a while, so. Margo, if, uh, if you could unmute, that would be fantastic. And then Jeremiah would be after that. I don't know if Margo's still on. Right, that looks like we're not gonna get through to Margo. Let's see if Jeremiah could unmute. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, happy to, uh, really just a comment. Um, been listening, uh, been at this uh, a long time. As full disclosure, I'm a longtime AFT staffer and uh, have uh, lived through uh, multiple iterations of um, national uh, farms under threat uh, type projects. And this is by far and above uh, the most detailed, uh, useful, and I think uh, will be very productive moving forward. So uh, good, to, good to be a part of this and uh, listening intently to all the the comments and observations. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know Jerry, he can be a curmudgeon. So when he says nice things, we all take it to heart and feel very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, um, let me see. Yeah, so I think that's it for the questions and um, we're right about at time. So I just wanna thank everybody so much um, for participating. Um, I don't know, Mitch or Jen, do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share before we sign off? Hmm. Mitch, how about you go first? Sure, yeah, I just wanna thank everybody again for joining us. I really appreciate your time and your interest, and I want to emphasize that this is hopefully the beginning of um, a lot of work that we can do together. Um, we have the report, we have a huge amount of useful data, 
hopefully um, it can help you do your work uh, and it can help us partner and collaborate to try to solve some of these issues. So I just encourage everybody to be in touch. Um, you know, this is a big team. We're all in it together. And if you need anything from us, um, feel free to, to shoot an email. I believe my email is on the web, but it's just mhunter at farmland.org. So feel free to be in touch. And thanks again. <laughs> I, had, I have two closing thoughts. First, I just want to thank all of the program managers out there who were so generous with their time and expertise as we worked on this project. There were staff at NRCS who certainly spent a lot of time with us helping us develop our PDR analysis. And definitely all the program managers who spent time with me on the phone helping me figure out how their programs worked. And then secondly, I just wanted to say to everyone that they are welcome to contact the Farmland Information Center with questions about our work on this project. And thank you for listening today. That's great. And, and, and I, I want to reiterate what Jen said. Um, the Farmland Information Center has an amazing website, but it also has an amazing staff um, who will answer your questions. Um, it's a staffed answer service. They'll answer them by phone or by email. And please um, avail yourselves of all these resources. We've tried very hard. Our report is long. It's 60-something um, pages. So we've created a lot of shorter resources for you to use, um, including an executive summary and what we call state highlight summaries of both the findings from the spatial or the mapping analyses and also from the policy squared. So all of this is available on that interactive website where you can both play with the maps, look at our data and download information to help you in your work. And as I, I said sort of at the end of, of my speaking, um, this is collaborative. We have to work together and we really hope that you will join us. We, we look forward to working with you going forward. Thank you so much for participating today. And Julia, if I can just jump in with one last statement. Um, on the subject of partnering, I just want to again thank our most critical partner in this work, which is NRCS. Uh, we really would not have been able to do this work without NRCS's support in so, so many different ways. Um, and we also know that NRCS is critical for getting the work done on the ground, especially in terms of easements on farms. So again, huge thank you to NRCS onward. We've got more good stuff coming and I'm sure we can make a ton of progress. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you.